Welcome back to Infectious Diseases. Uh, so today we're going to discuss Lecture 2. It's going to be a little bit more detailed about the control of infectious diseases. However, it's still going to be a lot of definitions. Um, I just wanted to kind of make sure that we all are in line with what the definitions that are going to be used in this course are. Uh, there's going to be a lot of inter-talk about um, things like control versus elimination versus eradication, and so I just want to make sure everyone understands what the differences are. It, Next week we'll start going into the individual diseases, and so I think the the more interesting stuff will start then. But you know we kind of have to make sure we get all of this this stuff taken care of uh, before we can move on. So let's just trudge right into it. So the first thing that you need to understand is, is the differences between the different levels of disease control and elimination. So control is probably the least um, the least. Uh, measured of the all the different programs. If you're doing a control program, all you're trying to do is reduce the disease incidence and prevalence and morbidity to an acceptable level as a result of deliberate efforts. These can be things like vaccination programs uh, for diseases like papillomavirus at this point, um, as well as diarrheal diseases. The, the reason for this is a lot of these diseases have environmental factors that make it uh, difficult to get beyond just a control level. Uh, diarrheal diseases, you've got contaminated food, uh, which will always be there in, you know, in different situations. Uh, some of the intestinal worms in developing countries, they have control programs because they have, they're constantly in the soil and it's very difficult to get them out of the soil. If you have a strong enough program and you have good, very well designed drugs that can actually um, help to eliminate the the diseases in an individual, you can actually move towards an elimination of disease. And this is a reduction of the disease to an incidence of zero in a specified area, geographical, it could be uh, typically geographical, but it could also be um, an environmental area and so on. And this is usually done through uh, various, very strong programs that are necessary to initiate these. Some of the best examples include neonatal tetanus, uh, some of the lymphatic filariasis programs, but also even now uh, malaria is a big program that's now pushing towards an elimination of the disease um, in Africa, in Asia, in the Americas, um, and they're even starting to talk about eradication, which we'll get into in just a second. Um, elimination of infections is the, is the reduction of zero incidence by a specific agent in the geographical area. So as a difference to elimination of disease, that you're actually just, get, in this case, you're getting rid of the disease. So it could be um, the disease is, I'm going to use lymphatic filariasis or elephantiasis as the example. If you can actually re reduce the amount of elephantiasis, people still may get infected with the disease, which is the infection, but they're not getting the disease. Another good example is uh, blinding trachoma. Um, you can actually get rid of trachoma this way. However, in so many situations, you actually have to get rid of the actual infection. You have to get rid of the infectious agent from the body completely. And this is elimination of infection. And this is the reduction of the infection to zero. And good examples of this include some of the measles and, and polio uh, virus uh, uh, elimination programs. They will be continued. Uh, there are considerations to move those to eradication. Polio is actually already on, on um, has eradication targets. So eradication is the permanent reduction worldwide. The key there is worldwide. It's the reduction of worldwide incidence of the infection caused by the infectious agent. You're effectively eliminating it from the entire planet um, as a disease state. However, in many situations, there are small pockets of the disease um, or infectious agent around. They are, t they are not in the population, but they may be in a laboratory or in a, um, uh, in a uh, bioweapons, unfortunately, bioweapons facility. Um, some of the examples of this are smallpox, theoretically. I have uh, the example stating none because no one officially says there's any smallpox around. But um, during the Soviet era times, there, were, there was a lab that in, in Russia that was producing tons of the uh, smallpox vaccine even after the eradication program was completed. Um, they claim they've since, since uh, er eliminated much of it, but the question remains as to whether it was all actually eradicated and destroyed. Uh, the CDC also, um, a lot of people say that the CDC has samples, that they use it for um, experimental reasons, but they do not claim that it exists and uh, officially, so therefore um, uh, officially that there are none that are li linked to, to extinction. Um, however, uh, 
if smallpox is truly eradicated, then we can call it extinct. Um, there's the next one that actually is, there's a couple more that are targeted for um, elimination, eradication. The smallpox uh, is the only one that's been done, but there's also polio that's being targeted, guinea worm, theoretically measles, and also malaria, um, but they still have some work to do on those. Most of these examples were taken from WHO. Uh, different programs have different, slightly different definitions, but most countries and most uh, international aid organizations fairly well agree on the different definitions here. So now what is the difference between prevention and control? Uh, you guys are all graduate students, so I probably don't need to get into too much of these details, so I'll just make it clear. Prevention is actually preventing people from getting the disease, keeping people from getting it in the first place, while control is actually preventing the disease to spread from person to person. So if a person is infected, control is to prevent it from another person getting infected. The interactions that affect the host. So you can, there's many different ways you can actually prevent the disease from affecting the host. Uh, chemoprophylaxis is a major one. Uh, this is, includes things like mass drug administrations. Mass drug administrations are campaigns in which you would basically give everyone the preventive treatment. In this case, it could be a vaccine, or you could give them a treatment, um, assuming that they're all infected, and that would be something like mass drug administration for malaria or something for soil-transmitted helminths. Um, Vaccination can be considered a chemoprophylaxis, but it's not really a drug, so it's, it's actually preventing the disease for its entirety, while true chemoprophylaxis may just prevent it for a short-term period. There's also physical barriers between the host and the vectors. Um, these can include things like uh, bed nets um, is a perfect example, and then treatment of the infected host. So if the host is actually infected, you can actually just treat them with drugs. There's other ways you can prevent transmission, and these include quarantine, which is a separation of people who may have been exposed to contagious uh, disease, and they are usually separated from those who may or may not become ill. This is a great example of this, what was going on with the Ebola outbreak, in which people were getting quarantined. In fact, whole towns were getting quarantined. Uh, there's a lot of eth ethical considerations to consider about this, um, but uh, in many situations, it's extremely effective um, if done properly, if the people are informed and they are accepting of it. However, if it's forced upon them, uh, you may be, get, you may get uh, I wouldn't say rebellion, but you may get actually, uh, you know, uh, um, uncooperative people, and that could also cause problems. Isolation is the separation of people who are ill from the infectious agents. So hospitals will often use this um, as a way to prevent spread of diseases. And then water and sanitation interventions. Um, you can prevent the disease by simply washing hands uh, or boiling water. Uh, and that goes with cooking. The same thing is, is if you cook the food, a lot of times the food that have the infectious agents are destroyed. And then finally, vector control. Uh, vector controls include things like uh, residential home spraying. Uh, DDT was used in the past a lot uh, for vector control. Um, in the 60s, however, it was uh, shown that it could cause problems with eagle eggs and, and caused a lot of environmental problems, so DDT was actually banned in many countries. Uh, even though it was a great health intervention, it caused a lot of problems. A lot of people are looking at DDT again, um, as well as some of the newer, uh, safer um, uh, vector control sprays. And they're, what they're doing is, is rather than mass spraying huge areas with tons of the stuff, they're doing very targeted residential spraying, just small areas around the house to prevent the mosquitoes from spreading. Also interactions, interventions that affect the environment. Water and sanitation we mentioned before. I talked about hand washing, uh, but also things like um, making sure that water, standing water is, uh, is um, removed if you have like a mosquito area. This works for certain uh, mosquitoes that tend to breed in small small areas like little tiny ponds or but not larger bodies of water so even like you know uh, tipping over uh, cups of water that are that are sitting around on the porch that can prevent mosquito uh, breeding areas proper food storage uh, at the proper temperature and then preparation of the food is another way we discussed that a little bit and then destruction of areas with that are good habitat for the agent we just discussed uh, the issue with the standing water trying to remove that um, that's probably one of the best examples. But also, um, whether it's long-term good or not, uh, for instance, another disease called schistosomiasis, they tend to grow in the, uh, the grass, the tall grass that around uh, riverbeds. Um, and if you can remove those, you can actually remove the, the um, 
agent that actually causes the transmission, the, the schistosomiasis has a part of its life cycle in the snail. We'll talk about that later. But if you can remove the, the growing habitat for the snail, you can destroy the infectious agent as well. The environmental trade-off for that is questionable and, and needs to be taken case by case. Interventions that affect the agent. We discussed pesticides um, and then insecticides, and I always talk about mosquitoes, but they're not the only one. There's also things like the tsetse fly and the uh, black fly, and there's a lot of different uh, insects, arthropods. You know, you have ticks, there are uh, fleas, and so all of them tend to transmit different diseases, and we'll discuss some of them as well in the future, but d different methods to prevent them from being able to spread the disease is important. Um, if you can't kill them, maybe the best way is to use repellents, mosquito repellent uh, with a high DET um, percentage is, is one of the best ways you can do it. And then biological control. Um, this includes things like um, there's, they're doing a lot of GMO type of insects now. There's actually, I think I just read something that they're going to be releasing in Florida, some uh, mosquitoes against uh, that have uh, resistance against different um, bio, uh, diseases, and they're going to um, release them into the environment. So that's an example of biological control. And then environmental modification. I think I just talked about that a little bit as well um, with the schistosomiasis and the removing of the reeds uh, and tall grass for the, um, uh, the snails. Uh, in China, they've actually taken whole riverbeds and uh, basically poured concrete over them um, to prevent the snail from transmitting the schistosomiasis. And that is, uh, I would say, extreme, but it, it was very effective. Uh, hopefully, it's not a long term. Maybe as the disease becomes lower incidence um, and controllable, they'll be able to remove that concrete and bring back the natural beauty. Uh, so, when you have an infectious disease outbreak, and we're going to talk a little bit about each of these steps, you have to make a decision um, pathway in which how to best control it. And the best way to control it is to follow this, this, this pathway. Um, this is fairly well established. Some of the earliest epidemiologists uh, focused on the different infectious disease outbreaks, and we'll go over some of the steps next. The first thing you have to do is detect an outbreak, and this requires active surveillance. Um, you could do passive surveillance, but active surveillance is the best way to do it. And active surveillance is basically a group conducting surveillance that is actively looking uh, constantly for the outbreak of a disease. Um, it's expensive to do this. Uh, it's time consuming. But you can, catch an, you can catch an outbreak much faster if you are doing active surveillance. Passive surveillance is, is conducting the surveillance by waiting for a report to happen. So it's basically what ends up happening. This is more typical uh, of diseases that are lower, lower incidence, um, in which if something happens and you get a patient coming into the hospital, uh, you'll notice that maybe two or three are coming in with the same symptoms, and you look up the symptoms, and you basically figure out, oh my god, there's an outbreak going on. And so that's kind of what ends up being the surve passive surveillance, is, is basically it's not looking for the disease, but having the disease pop up in front of you. Then there's also sentinel sites. Uh, there are, this is kind of falls into a halfway point of an active and passive surveillance, but se sentinel sites are basically health facilities or different areas where people are chosen and facilities are chosen to provide surveillance for a particular disease. Um, in some cases, they are looking actively. In some cases, they're looking passively, but they have a special um, focus on that one individual disease. Once you find a case, the next key is to figuring out what is the causing, uh, causing the outbreak um, and to identify the case. This is, uh, the cases may help provide the information you need to find the cause of the epidemic. After you find them, you have to interview them. Uh, the individuals may be hesitant because they are, they're afraid of what's going on. They may be too sick to be able to talk about who their contacts were, um, and that's contact tracing. You have to, once you find an individual, you have to find out who they were in contact with. If it's a foodborne disease, you have to find out what they ate, where they ate it, and, and many, other, uh, many other questions that relate to such. And in several cases, you have to set up emergency reporting. A lot of times, these diseases could be extremely deadly. Ebola is a great example. And you have to set up an emergency reporting. You have to contact the national health facilities and make sure that um, all the cases are reported accordingly. Then you have to gen generate a hypothesis. You have to use to script descriptive statistics to find out who is affected. Um, are there any special uh, groups, food po uh, age groups, any special um, populations that are getting infected? Is it related to uh, a particular area, a geographical area? And then you have to also figure out what were the common, ex common exposures. 
was it um, you know was it a food related was was it a uh, was it a hospital infection nosocomial infection for instance and so on. Then you can test the hypothesis. Yes, this is hypothesis testing 101. Um, I apologize for this, but this is the way it's done. Um, you know, it's it's the scientific method at its best, and it's been around for hundreds of years. You have to basically, when you're trying to figure out what the epidemic uh, was caused by, you do a case control study. Um, can be helpful, but not necessarily um, not necessary in many case situations. Uh, you have to use the laboratory testing as well, and to be able to truly identify what the disease is. In many cases, some of these diseases at the early stages um, present as any other disease. You know, malaria can present as, as a simple cold in the early stages, um, but can quickly get out of hand, uh, especially if there's an outbreak going on. So you have to be able to have good laboratory testing available and um, finding out what people ate and where they ate it, uh, and then that's also finding out what the causative agent is. And then you basically, next step is to solve the hypothesis. Uh, what are the potential treatments that you can use? Um, well, how do you actually get rid of it at the source? If it was a contamination issue, who was the producer of the food product? You know, you have to, then you do a recall of all those foods. If it was uh, in an, like a mosquito-borne disease, was it because of heavy rains? Was it because of you know inadequate uh, bed net distribution? And you basically work to figure out what the what the issues were, and you and you try to come up with solutions for it. And then you control it. If it was a food outbreak, you destroy all the you know you recall the food, you destroy the food, and you move on. Um, if it was you know an issue like a mosquito outbreak uh, with with malaria, you know you may need to you know have a, an emergency bed net distribution or an emergency um, PCT preventive chemotherapy treatment in the area. Um, you know, I talk about here mostly food, but it's uh, food is a big issue, but it's um, not the only issue you need to focus on. And then you you have to monitor and evaluate and decide has the outbreak uh, been over. And what you do typically is you just follow the outbreak um, for if once you've determined what the causative agent is, you have to follow the outbreak for effectively two life cycles of the disease itself. And this is what was going on in Ebola when the outbreak was going on still is technically. When the outbreak was going on, um, what people did was is they followed the uh, life cycle. So if you're contagious for 21 days, you have to follow two life cycles of that. And that's basically to make sure that if someone got infected on the last day of that 21 days, who could be the last person infected, to make sure that they are not infected either. So you have to wait 21 days for that potential last person to show that he's not infected. And that's, that's basically how you determine whether it is. And once you've actually followed the outbreak for the two life cycles of its exist of the, of the life cycle of the, of the pathogen, you can declare that it's now the outbreak is over. And then to prevent future outbreaks is to basically you know, use the information you've learned and figure out what were the causative agents, um, and then develop programs around that to effectively control it. You also have to consider the ethical and practical concerns in outbreak investigation, making sure that the public is appropriately informed but not overly alarmed. And this, you know, the gamut was showed all over the place with the Ebola outbreak in which, you know, in some cases people were getting resistant because they were being quarantined without permission. Emergency quarantines can also cause problems. And then in many cases, you know, those people that were quarantined were stigmatized by other groups. Um, you know, they could be, people might be afraid that they are still infectious even if they're not after the quarantine is over. So you have to be able to work with those type of situations. And then controlling the source by isolating and quarantining individuals um, must be done in accordance with the laws and the principle of human rights. So as I mentioned before, you know, you have to make sure that you're doing it appropriately where they're properly informed um, and that they're told, you know, that this is, uh, I don't necessarily want to claim that it needs to be voluntary. Um, you know, you may be able to do a, a forced quarantine, but you know that would be an extreme situation in which the general health public is uh, is at risk. So, you have to take these individual situations one by one and work with the people to try to get them to understand what the significance is of the of the particular outbreak. And that's really all I have for today's lecture. Um, it was a quick one, I know, but I think uh, it's a good introduction to the. The topic, and I think from now on we can start getting into some of the individual diseases, um, and uh, I'm looking forward to talking with you guys about them. Thank you very much.